very big major meeting in Cairo, Cairo around population. There was a very big meeting even earlier, but in the 90s in um, Rio, I believe, as I recall, around environment. So, so just first of all, let's put this into context. The 90s was a very interesting time internationally because there were these very, very major meetings around substance, around environment, around population, around women, around social um, action. Uh, that was in Copenhagen. And those meetings led to a, generally a global um, agreement by the various countries in the world on 193, generally, generally, there were differences, but generally around these subjects, which led to the creation of a global set of goals in the year 2000 called the Millennium Development Goals. They were very important. They dealt with education, they dealt with um, uh, health, they dealt with maternal health, they dealt, dealt with food security, they dealt with water and sanitation, um, they dealt with uh, environment. So uh, these meetings were very important. Just to put that meeting that you mentioned in, in, that was 25 years ago in Beijing, it, it was an interesting meeting. Uh, the Chinese also, uh, very interesting, they separated the uh, NGOs from the official delegates very much and they sent the NGOs, this was a big controversy in those days. I think the Chinese might still in some ways do this. They sent the, and as would many other countries right now, frankly, a lot of countries have really started to hit back on civil society and NGOs. Uh, they, sent them, they sent the NGOs off to, um, up into the hills, into the very, there's been a lot of rain, a lot of mud. So in any case, this meeting was very important because it kind of set um, the agenda around gender, if I can use that, although there are two genders, but around, or there, the, the general subject of gender um, for the next 10 years, frankly, 10 to 15 years uh, for the Millennium Development Goals. And then in, um, um, in 2015, we have uh, a more sophisticated set of global goals called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So that's number one. So number two, out of that um, a conference, and again, apart from her suit, Hillary Clinton did make the statement that women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. So I would say, in my view, one of the most significant improvements globally from that meeting, not just from that meeting, but that has occurred over the last 25 years, when you look at girls and women, is the improvement in education. Um, a dramatic improvement. Um, uh, extraordinary progress in enrollment. Um, uh, the per, you know, the percentage of children out of school, and that, that is an element that people has fallen worldwide in virtually every region of the world. Um, much of that was the result of, again, an, an impetus subsequent to that meeting and then in the 90s into the, the 2000s to do away with school fees. Um, we don't have school, well, we don't have specific school fees in this country, but school fees exist. There are other kinds of fees. You still have book fees and you still have uniforms. But with school fees, particularly in the poorest countries, if parents had to pay school fees, they were more likely to send the boys to school than girls to school. And so there was a big movement um, in the 90s and 2000s to do away with school fees and a dramatic increase in enrollment of girls and boys into school. Um, uh, and I, frankly, now I'm doing pre-COVID, I'll get to COVID in a moment, but pre-COVID, clearly on any one day in this, in this country today, uh, at least a billion children um, in school. And again, because of those things called the Millennium Development Goals, sorry to use all this gobbledygook, um, which also encouraged specifically um, uh, encourage countries to assure that all girls and boys got a primary education. There was a dramatic, over the years, up until now, a dramatic reduction of the gap between the number of boys and the number of girls in school. So, so I, my, I put my flag out to say that I think one of the most important things that has happened over the last 25 years is boys and girls, for the most part, in most parts of the world, prior to COVID-19, uh, boys and girls for the most part were enrolling in primary education. Now, what, what's, what's the down in all of this, even pre-COVID? A, 
the schools weren't ready for this. They didn't have enough teachers. They didn't have enough capacity. Um, there was, a, it, you know, for everybody who said, well, poor people don't want to send their girls to school. Forget it. They did. They wanted to send their girls to school, even though the girls were doing all the chores at home. And countries weren't really ready for this, but nevertheless, they tried to accommodate to it. Uh, but in the last few years, because it's been so difficult, we've really seen a um, kind of a, a, a stalling, if you will, of kids going to school in, in all parts of the world other than South and East Asia. Um, and in, um, but still, in 2018, um, you still had a significant number of kids. On the other hand, you still had about one out of every six children around the world, or about 260 million children, who were um, at least enrolled in school. The second element was they were enrolling, but it didn't mean they were necessarily getting an education. And so the quality of education was a big issue. I meant, I'm sorry for this gobbledygook that I mentioned in 2000, the, the global goals were around all children getting a primary education, but it didn't talk about whether they, or all children going to school, they said. It didn't tell, say whether they should be getting any good education. By the time we got to the next set of global goals, it talked about all children getting a quality education. So there's been more attention now to at least whether kids were learning anything at all, but they weren't in many cases. And the kids who were now to, not in school now, those uh, 260 million children who pre-COVID were not in school, were, as you might expect, and I'm about to finish, so then you can ask some questions, they were the poor, they were the marginalized, they were the disabled, they were the indigenous. Um, um, and about a third of the world's poorest girls um, between the age of 10 and 18 uh, were also not in school. Secondly, the focus had been on primary school, not on secondary school. And we all know, well, we don't all know, but I will tell you, we know, the world knows. And the facts, I feel like Andrew Cuomo now, let me talk about facts. The facts are, we know that girls, if they get not only a primary education, but a second educa secondary education, this is not college, this is secondary, they're more likely to, their children are more likely to be healthy. They are more likely to be healthy. They are more likely to be economically secure. That doesn't mean they might still, still not be poor, but economically secure. They're less likely to, be, um, to become infected with AIDS because they can make better choices about their life. And they're less likely to be a victim of violence. So I'm gonna stop at this point, but just say the bottom, for me, the bottom line in, in what's kind of the best thing that has happened since that meeting in Beijing that was all about women and girls has been this dramatic improvement in girls around the world getting an education. But the key things that aren't good is that girls still aren't, the, the, there's still a gap between girls and boys in secondary um, for a variety of reasons. And, um, uh, and the quality of education still isn't uh, there. Now we have COVID and the problem is for all the focus on getting kids into school, everybody's out of school. So it's not clear what's gonna happen after this. We're gonna to have to get kids back into school, but for all the challenges around the world, particularly in the poorest or the most challenged countries, but everywhere, what's education going to look like? I mean, we used to, even in the poorest places, we, we might have 60 kids in a, in a very small, Hopefully you even had a room. Well, you can't have 60 kids in a room. I mean, you're gonna to have to have spacing. Um, you didn't have enough teachers. Well, you're gonna have fewer teachers because some of the teachers now have died. Um, so the, the, so the, cha the global challenge post COVID is, is around education is in my view, quite dramatic. Um, and then you have, we've learned even in the richest countries, enormous, and it's just, this is this everywhere, but enormous disparity between those who have the capacity to learn using modern me uh, techniques, as we're doing here, electronically, and those even in the richest countries who don't have that capacity, whether they're in rural areas where they have no, no internet or in urban areas, but they still don't have any, they don't, they don't have a computer. Uh, um, so, uh, so, uh, to me, 
I think we celebrate how far we've come. We can build on how far we've come in education, but COVID's going to turn education upside down. And my final comment will be, I think that's terrible and I think it's good all in the same place because, and I apologize to any educators who are on the line, but the most um, traditional people I've ever met in my life are people in education. And I've long said, this is terrible, but because I'm not an educator, but I've long said, get education out of the hands of educrats and, and, or get it partly out of the hand of educrats. And I'm hoping that maybe, because we're really gonna have to think new ways of doing education around the world, it's going to be a real challenge, but we're gonna have to think of new ways to do education around the world. If we can get some people who are not necessarily education people, as well as good education people, I think, I think there may be some opportunities. Sorry to go on so long. Glad to take some questions or whatever. I definitely agree, and I think that's been something that has been covered in the U.S. media, not as much as I would hope it would be covered about all around the world, but the fact that these inequities between students are going to be divided even more now with all of this post-COVID recovery period. But I was wondering, like, what do you think is the most important step people need to take to kind of retain student enrollment in these, like, schools? So when there are issues of deciding which child you're going to send to school maybe in a post-COVID setting, how are you going to make sure that they retain, like you said, that increased number of student enrollment? But I know, again, like we can't possibly know what the answer is, but if you had any ideas about how that could um, thing. Uh, well, I think it's going to be crucial to keep um, pressure on these global goals. I mean, I'm sure none of you online here get up every morning and think about, I wonder how the sustainable, uh, uh, the SDGs are doing. But I mean, governments have made commitments to try and pursue these, um, um, you know, these development goals. And, and, we, and we actually had, as I said, I think had had some pretty significant improvements. So, um, so um, hopefully, from the poorest to the richest, there's going to be some thinking about this. If anything, though, good and bad coming out of it, I think COVID has illustrated even more starkly the importance of inclusion and, and, and the challenge of disparities and the challenge of inequities. Uh, there's, no, there's no silver, silver bullet or a magic wand, but you know, you can try to ignore it. Oh, oh man, let's just not notice that. But COVID just puts it front and center, I think, to policymakers that there are incredible inequities in the world, which are not gonna be solved overnight. But unless that's taken into, into account in terms of policy making more than it has been, and I'm talking about everywhere, poorest to the richest, I, I think we're still going to, we're going to find ourselves in a pretty uh, weak place in recovering from this. We're not going to recover. I mean, in, in the changed world, that we're, we're going to recover. I'm sorry. We will recover. But it'll be, there'll be some changes. Um, and I'm hoping that the fact that it's just so forced a, 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 a I hope a more, un, uh, not an understanding, but a more recognition that the, that the, the issue of inclusion and the issue, that, it, that doesn't mean everybody's gonna get the same thing, doesn't mean everybody's the same, doesn't mean we can guarantee everything, but understanding that we have got to take on the disparity issue globally I'm hoping that that will be one of the opportunities, at least, that come out of the post-COVID. Post-COVID meaning we're going to be in COVID and out in COVID and in COVID and out in COVID, but as we move forward. Um, and we got a question from Julia that was asking about, like, again, struggling with educational equity, but especially when so many economies are going to be struggling post-COVID and how to kind of, like you said, get people to prioritize and maybe what the role of businesses and people will be in kind of mainstreaming education as a priority when economies are struggling? Well, I, to me, education is still a public good and is largely a government responsibility. That doesn't mean there can't be private education, um, but I think it's largely government responsibility. And in fact, if you look, even in the poorest countries, um, budgets for education tend to be about the largest budget in, in 
if you look at their finances as large as budget, but that's large, that's mainly because of teacher salaries. But again, these teachers are not making, I mean, just like this country, frankly, but even in the poorest countries, they're not making big salaries. It's just that education is such a large component. And particularly in your poor countries, the, the, the percentage of the population being young is very, very significant. But I do think that, I mean, I think the private, you know, I, 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 to me, I, the, the role of education is to basically give a foundation for people. And I see the role of the private sector more in developing the, the, the in, in, in for their own good, because it has to be a win-win situation, but developing the more specific capacities it, as long as you come out of your basic education system. And in many parts of the world, certainly your poorer countries, if you can come out, out, out of secondary school with a basic capacity to handle math and and, and language and, and, and engage that the role of business is more along the lines of giving you the specific skills that you need to, to engage in, in that environment. And, and I mean, it's in business interest too. They need workers, they need consumers. So it's in their interest that the education system works. So it isn't a matter of don't fund education. It's a matter of how can you fund education that can create at least a foundational basis for the, the population in your country? Um, I've got another question about school vouchers. And the question was that theoretically they're intended to improve education by promoting competition among schools. But do you think there's a push for such a program to get more school funding? And do you think this type of policy is something that would be worth doing? Okay, now I'm going <laughs> to, I don't know much about anything, but what I mostly don't know anything about is our own education system in the United States, because most of my work has been international. So vouchers tend to be more a U.S. thing matter, and I'm not, I'm sorry, I, I, I have to beg, all, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you dump on me and, uh, for things, but I'm not trying to avoid a question. I just don't have a healthy sense of vouchers. Um, because they tend to be more this country, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just less familiar with the education system in this country because my work yeah. is most international. Having said that, I think that again is a, a um, um, you know, I, I, I think, I, I think the issues of equity are real issues, and we have to assure that our. I mean, I, people, I think people have a right to have a choice about the schools they're gonna send, but that means that, that we, then we have to be prepared to assure that our, the school, that our basic schools, we have, a, we have in this country, and we're committed to public education. We're committed to funding publication, public education. Then we have to be committed to funding publication, public education. So voting down, you know, older, crappy people like me who vote down school bond issues when they really need school bond issues because we don't want to pay any more taxes. I mean, that may or may not be a correct thing in a particular place, but, but we have to understand that we, if you want a public, if you want a publicly supported free public education system in this country, then you've got to be prepared to assure that you're going to put the resources into it. That doesn't mean that there can't be competition. I think competition is a good thing, but the competition can't be because you're starving one and, and therefore you say, I'm going to that's, send somebody somewhere else. So I'm not generally opposed to vouchers as long as there's an understanding that we have a commitment to assuring that we should be funding our public education system adequately. And frankly, after COVID, with all the parents who've had to try and pretend to be teachers, hopefully maybe we'll recognize how, not only how important our healthcare frontline workers are, but how important our teachers are as well. I definitely agree. Um, and then kind of, like you said, focusing more on your experience in the international education sector, what kind of challenges did you face at UNICEF in attempts to kind of mainstream those gender issues in education? Because I know, like you said, like in the 90s, it was an era kind of of all these big conferences happening. So did you have a lot of struggles in kind of getting people to focus on women and girls? No, well, yes, yeah, no. Um, you know, no, there was a commitment, as I said, in the 90s. So, I mean, doing away with school fees had a major impact on children coming to school and particularly girls. I mean, it wasn't just made for girls. It was made for boys and girls. But, but when the poorest parents, if they could only afford a little bit of money, they'd pay the fees for the boys, or if they could only afford a little, they'd do the 
um, uniform for the boy. And so get it, doing my three with fees was very important. Secondly, another challenge was, again, not only primary education, but girls into secondary education. Because you tend to have fewer secondary schools. They tend to be further apart. Parents don't want the girls to walk that far because of violence and potential attacks. Um, things as important and really important as separate sanitary facilities, particularly in secondary school, um, separate latrines, very important, particularly when girls begin um, to menstruate. It's just very important because their parents, I mean, uh, I mean, parents will send their boys to school even there are no sanitary facilities, but they won't uh, for girls. Um, so, I mean, those were some of the challenges. But the other challenge I would say, and this is boys and girls, um, was particularly in humanitarian environments, in, 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 um, uh, in emergencies, um, whether they were, um, uh, you know, uh, tornado, uh, well, not tornadoes, uh, uh, what, I mean, uh, storms or uh, landslides or, or floods or, or war or those kinds of things. Um, everybody would, most everybody would think, of course, we need to keep people alive. So health was always seen as an intervention in an emergency, but education was always seen as something, once the emergency comes down, then we'll get back to education. Well, particularly in areas of conflict, not so much in natural disasters, but even in natural disasters, but particularly in areas of conflict, the wars of the 21st century are, are quite different from the wars of the 20th century. I, this is a bit broad brushing. But the wars of the 20th century tended to be between two nation states. The wars of the 21st century tend to be internal to countries. So they are, they're, they rip, they're like a rotor rooter that rips, rips countries apart. And they're, they're religious and ethnic and tribal and north, south, east, west, all, all different kinds of things. And they go on forever and ever and ever. And so if you delay kids getting back into school, that's a terrible thing. But, but you found in the humanitarian work, healthcare, immediately go right in there and do something. But education will wait till things calm down. Well, these conflicts go on for years and years and years, 20, 30. The average, I think the average conflict now around the world goes on for something like 18 to 19 years and closer to 25 to 30 years. Well, you've lost whole generations of children. So when you ask me what, what one of the challenges, one of the challenges is to continue to advocate to the donors in particular, the importance of providing funding to let some kind of schooling, it didn't have to be a school, but some kind of schooling start as soon as possible in a crisis situation, because the best thing you can do for children in an abnormal situation is try and give them some normality and some kind of schooling, if only an, under a tree, gave them a little bit of sense of normalcy again. But it, it, it's still a big fight to try and get education seen as both an emergency and a development intervention as contrasted with health and water and other things. And you said um, you've been talking about your intervention in humanitarian emergencies. And I know at your time at UNICEF, you worked in coordination with other UN programs like the WHO and worked on different kind of child vaccination campaigns and things like that. So what does that kind of global action look like? And what does it really take to do one of these big kind of campaigns for vaccines? And if, if and when hopefully there becomes a vaccine for COVID-19, how is it going to affect these humanitarian emergencies and how will the vaccination campaigns look like in those areas? I think particularly for COVID-19, we have to learn from um, the experiences of vaccination campaign. I, first of all, I believe passionately in, in basic vaccination. I'm not, I don't believe in sticking a lot of needles in you, but I believe that children should get those basic five, uh, you know, it's a, it's a single, um, immunization, but basic. Uh, there is probably nothing safer. Nothing, nothing in the entire world is one thousand, thousand, thousand percent safe. But there's almost nothing safer than that basic childhood immunization. So I'm sorry, there might be some anti-vaxxers on here, and if you are, I, I respect you, but I disagree with you uh, vehemently. Um, so I believe passionately in your basic, basic immunization. But I think there are lessons to be learned. 
And here's the lesson in, for COVID-19. So I, I bring it up to now. Um, kind of, we went through two phases. We went through a very major, uh, there was a very big push based on what had happened in getting rid of smallpox many, many years ago. There was, there's been a very major push over the last now 30, 40 years to, to get rid of, totally to get rid of polio. And so the way to get rid of polio was, um, and which is a thing we should get rid of, it doesn't kill, kill people for the most part, but it does cripple people. And we have the capacity, we have um, the drops on the tongue, the polio vaccine. Um, we have the shot and also the drops on the tongue. But the problem, what I wanna learn from is the way we, we the world, when I say we, we the world, WHO, UNICEF, everybody involved in uh, Gates, everybody involved in vaccination, um, approach polio was to have these very big, like um, marching bands would come in. I don't mean marching, but, but yeah, I mean, they would come in and we'd say, today we're going to vaccinate everybody in the village, everybody in the community, everybody, blah, 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 uh, lots of noise, or this week we're going to do that. And the problem with that, and I would say for me and COVID-19, is it was outsiders coming in doing it. And, we, and it wasn't, it didn't focus on strengthening the basic health services of the community. Whereas your other immunization programs were more focused on strengthening basic health services so that local people could um, engage in, in good public health. So I, what I hope, so measles, for example, is more building a local capacity so we could uh, back, so it wasn't people coming in from the outside, parachuting in, not quite parachuting in, but driving in or whatever. And so I hope for COVID-19, what we learn is let's not have a whole bunch of, um, I mean, we can in the beginning, but a whole bunch of outsiders come in. Let's build the local capacity, whether it's the local capacity in New Rochelle, New York, <laughs> which was a hot spot, or in um, uh, Kampala in Uganda, or in uh, some place in Northern Thailand, help build the local capacity to be able to deliver the public health services so that the kind of whatever interventions, immunization, whatever can go on. I mean, when, once we have the vaccine, we don't have the vaccine right now, I mean, but still even building that local public health capacity is helpful in conveying to people what they need to do even before we get the the vaccine. So I, I feel very strongly there are lessons to be learned from the immunization campaigns of the 1990s and 2000s and 2010s that are totally, totally appropriate for COVID-19. I also, what I've been thinking about a lot with the new COVID efforts and thinking about how these kind of global campaigns, like you said, would happen, but also kind of supporting those local institutions. A question that we got was about if you think that the new COVID-19 pandemic, what kind of effect it will have on countries' willingness and organizations' willingness to provide international aid, and if you think that it will have a positive or negative impact on how much people will want to kind of engage in these either humanitarian emergencies or just general kind of development programming, and if you think it's going to dissuade people or kind of make them realize more how important it is to invest in these kind of programs. I actually think it's going to be both. I mean, I think, I think there's no question that over the next, in the short term, and I, by that I mean year, two years, whatever, three, I mean the financial, uh, we're going to have some pretty tight financial uh, situation. I say to the different um, little organizations I'm still working with that we'll probably get through this year because the funding has probably been allocated, but budgets are going to be tighter and tighter and tighter. But I think recognizing the importance of global institutions. I mean, we live in a, I mean, if any, I mean, what's, sorry, with all due respect to our own country right now, if anything, uh, this virus has reminded us that the world doesn't exist with walls anymore. I mean, what happens in um, Papua New Guinea today could be happening in, um, New Delhi tomorrow and in um, 
New Orleans the next day. I, I, I you know, and I, I in, in good ways and in bad ways. So we live, we live in a globalized world today. It do, I mean, that doesn't mean we have to hug everybody and love everybody. We don't have to hug everybody and love everybody. And there'll still be, you know, differences of views and negotiations and things like that. But I, I mean, I think, I, I, I hope that people will recognize that we need, um, we need domestic institutions, but we need global institutions. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anybody who, who has any who knowledge of WHO that doesn't think probably it's a little too bureaucratic and it needs a little kicking up in its tush, as we would say in New York. And, uh, you know, and probably a little shaking up, but no other public health institution, a global public health institution has the capacity that a WHO has to, to convene people around health issues in the world. Um, uh, um, Elements of that, for example, UNICEF, where I was, can play a role. I mean, the way UNICEF is able to convene people around children's issues, but UNICEF can play a role in some of the immunization. Uh, the refugee agency can play a role, but WHO plays a major role. And it's not the only one. I mean, there are other very important um, health institutions around the world. But I think understanding that we, we need a mixture of our domestic capacities, clearly, and we need to celebrate our domestic capacities and not be not be not run away from our domestic capacities, but we need global institutions as well. And so I, 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 I worry for funding in the short term because I just think global, the global economy is, we just can't keep printing money. The global economy is going to be very stretched in the next few years. But um, I, I do believe in the long term, for the most part, it, it will not result in a, um, and an un unwillingness to fund some of these global, some, uh, there are some global institutions that should go away. I mean, I'm, I worked at the UN for almost 15 years. I love the, I, I love elements of the UN. I think the UN plays a role in so many ways. It's so important, but there's some elements of the UN should probably disappear. They long, long ago, they should have gone away. But I always say the only thing harder than starting something at the UN is stopping it. Um, but some of these global institutions are just critical, and, you know, WHO, the Refugee Agency, the World Food Program, UNICEF, so th these are critical organizations. I definitely agree, and I think that hopefully it kind of increases a sense of global empathy rather than apathy, and it will be something that like facilitates a more sustainable kind of international engagement, but I guess we'll have to see. But um, some of the other questions we've gotten have been on kind of around women in politics and in reference to the Beijing conference, there was a goal of having 30% of national legislators be women by a set date. Um, but then there has also been a lot of focus around COVID-19 and how female legislators have been doing um, possibly, or have been seen to show better results in handling this pandemic. Do you think that the pandemic will delay any progress in gender parity within politics? And how do you think that there has been a significant difference in response between male and female political leaders around. Well, wasn't there the thing that said, why are these seven countries doing better than other countries? So can everybody name the seven countries? Who can name the seven countries? <laughs> I, I remember. Who, 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 what are they telling you? New Zealand and Germany are two, and Denmark off the top of my head. Those are three I know of. And okay. Iceland. Mm -hmm. That's four. Any more? Come on, guys, that's four. Taiwan. Don't be shy. You mm -hmm. can speak up. <laughs> Five. And I'm trying to remember now. Oh, Irma, what's her name? Norway, come on, the Nordics. Oh. We're missing one, I think, right now. God, I'm, I'm, now I'm blocking on it. Um, well, I, I, look at, I, um, I actually forwarded to your, uh, to Gretchen, uh, uh, the, 
something from the Secretary General of the UN about the impact of COVID on women. So maybe, maybe some of you may be interested in, you can just look at the website on that. I mean, the pluses and minuses. I mean, there's some great leadership out there, but there are clearly are gonna be some minuses. I mean, we, we've learned that um, um, uh, uh, you know, 70% of the frontline health workers are women. Um, that, that's good, but that's also bad because we also know some of the frontline health workers are, are more um, impacted than others. And that's 78% in the, in the United States. Um, also women uh, are, are, are also provide the majority of support services in terms of health. And by that, I mean laundry, cleaning, food, and the implications for them. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I think the potential for existing gender gaps, and they exist already, uh, might be exacerbated by COVID-19. You know, uh, majority, of the, majority of the single parents in the world are women, and so the economic implications, majority of the elderly in the, in the world uh, are women. I know it's falling slightly more heavily on men, but again, to the extent to which those <laughs> us vulnerables, us old folks, um, women, uh, and the majority of low paying jobs in the world are held by women. Again, not, this is not that it's great for men, it, it sure as heck isn't great for men, but um, uh, you know, some of the potential negative implications for COVID-19. We also know that whenever there is some kind of, kind of chaos in the world, things like child marriage and trafficking, well, let me tell, say, bad guys, and there are some bad women too, but bad guys slash women, uh, um, love to get away with things uh, and can get away with things more when there's a little disruption or chaos in the world. So things like child, child marriage and trafficking tend to um, um, go up. Um, the issue of domestic violence has been uh, identified uh, with pe people staying home of, of greater implications. Um, it took us many years, even in this country, to begin to understand that we just, the idea of dealing with domestic violence wasn't just, you know, the, again, it's not only the men to women, but it's more men to women. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, hey guy, calm down and then throw the woman back in that situation. But here we're, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, sheltered in place. And so domestic violence has been going up. Um, uh, so I, there can be positives, but there are also some real potential negative implications for COVID-19 in terms of the gender gap that's, that while it is closed globally, still exists. And we got a comment that said the last country was Finland. So oh, that's yeah, the Finland. seventh yes, country. Finland, of <laughs> Number one in reputation. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and obviously you have worked in a lot of different global education fields. You were a Peace Corps volunteer and then helped run the Peace Corps and then you also worked at SIT in the world learning. Um, so why do you think and how do you think that students now who maybe are college age students or even students coming up into their higher education, how should they become better informed global citizens, especially in the midst of this pandemic? And why do you think that it's so important to have kind of an international focused education, especially in today's world? Well, first of all, I don't think you have to be a global citizen. I don't think you have to have a lot of stamps in your passport to be a global citizen. Mm. I, I, I don't think you ever even have to leave your local neighborhood to be a global citizen. In, in my mind, a global citizen, whatever that means, but it's just, it, you're, it's your mind. Your mind is what makes you the global, it, it, that you were open to, again, okay, not loving everybody and we can't even hug anybody anymore. Um, but it's opening, it's, it's open to differences. It's opening to recognize their, the, 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 pl the pluses and minuses uh, of differences. It's opening, it's, it's uh, people with different views, different, uh, who look different, who act different, who have different cultures, but, but, but appreciating them rather than fearing them, uh, um, celebrating them in some ways or, or not, not, not celebrating them, if you will. Now, that doesn't mean you can't travel somewhere else, but, it, but to me, global citizen is the global part and the citizen part, both, frankly, are, have 
very little to do with how many planes you've gotten on or how many countries you've gone to. But that being said, I also, um, you know, to the extent to which there is the, uh, I know you've done study abroad, I, I, the extent to which there is the opportunity either while in school or afterwards or before gap years or gap months or whatever the case may be to to experience another culture. I think that's a wonderful way to do that. And you could do that actually in this country as well, but doing it elsewhere. I mean, I mean, uh, hope maybe you'll understand this. When the time I was at World Learning with SIT, one of the things that I found a little, a little shocking was, and maybe that percentages have changed a bit, but in, but this was only 10 years, well, yeah, 10 years or so, a little bit more than 10 years ago, that about 40%, which is getting close to half of all American students who study abroad, study in only four, in four countries. And they are wonderful countries. I love them and I wanna to go to all of them again. Um, but, uh, and they are in no particular order, the UK, France, um, Spain, and Italy. But if, you're, if you study abroad and you're just in another building with a lot of other Americans, I mean, you're in another country, but you know, if you're gonna do a study abroad, step out of your comfort zone. Uh, you don't have to go some terrible place. I wouldn't suggest that at all, but um, you know, the whole idea is to experience another culture. I mean, find a program where you can get academic credit, but uh, challenge yourself, learn something else, learn and help learn another language or something or, or do something. So, I, I mean, I think I, we live in a, we live in a world today, pre-COVID, but it's even after that, it'll take a while. It'll take a while. So we'll wear a mask when we go and, and there'll be nobody in the middle seat. That's a great thing, frankly, nobody in the middle seat. Um, but, you know, experience some other cultures. Um, uh, this is the time to do it. And because those other cultures are, because we're all gonna be parts of other cultures. So I'm, uh, again, to me, global citizen is largely in your mind, not in your travel itinerary. But if you have the opportunity to travel, do that as well. I think that is a common theme, but I think that even just at Gettysburg, we have such a big population that studies abroad, but I do definitely see that there is a lot of kind of focus in the European countries, but I think we're starting to kind of spread out more. So I hope that that continues, but I mean, I know they, that I mean, let me be clear, they're great countries, but I mean, it's just, yeah. if you're gonna to go to one of them, see, go, go live with a family or something. They're just don't stay in a location. Look at, when you get out of your American bubble, you, you almost appreciate America even more. I mean, it's, it's not to put America down, it's to appreciate, in some ways, to appreciate it even more. <laughs> Definitely. And I know um, a lot of the students who are probably on here and probably some of the faculty and alumni are also interested in similar fields that you've worked in, in international development and just kind of global affairs. So what advice would you have for those students who kind of strive to engage in a similar field and ways that they can do so in a way that is sustainable and also something that they can like, how can they become engaged in this field more, I would say? Well, uh, I don't, I, I have no job uh, advice, but I mean, the, the skills aren't, I mean, basic skills. I mean, we all need basic skills. I mean, we basic communication skills, basic writing skills. I, I, um, I you know, I'm, a, uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't hire me because it's been 50 years, but I'm a lawyer by education. But uh, a lot of, Somehow I find young people who are thinking about going to law school think they have to take political science and I apologize if there are any political science uh, majors here. Nothing wrong with that. It's very good. But, you know, I, I say, look at, take history, take literature. I mean, get a good grounding, whatever, in, in areas um, um, before, you be, before you specialize, frankly. And I mean, <laughs> Even when I was a lawyer, so the international law is just doing the same thing, but in a, a building in another country, it isn't exactly the same thing. But uh, it's you, the skills you need. You need communication skills. You need management skills. You need uh, hopefully writing skills. People, 
people don't write very well anymore. Uh, just simple writing, simple writing. I mean, to me, that somebody who can write a one-page memo rather than a six-page memo is more better and say the same thing. Um, common sense, just basic common sense. Um, um, be inquisitive. Um, ask questions. Just very basic skills. I, uh, this, you know, I mean, yes, language can help for international, but other than language, there aren't any other particular skills that you necessarily need for international development, international diplomacy, international business, international whatever, international, international. They're the same skills as you need in your local community to, to run a good business, to run a good NGO, to run a good, uh, um, to govern, to be involved in government. I mean, all of these apply as much. And then, and so I don't, I don't, I don't see a dividing line other than occasionally language, although because we Americans are so dreadfully horrible in language, most of the world speaks English today, but um, language can be helpful. But I, other than that, I don't, um, I, I think the skills are really quite, there's not a separate set of skills for international and, and the skills for domestic. Thank you. And I think we have one more question that came through. Um, that was from Natalie and she asked, do you think America's response to COVID-19 has brought us closer together as a nation or divided us further? And I think that this can be applied to the global context as well. Do you think it's brought us together more as a global community or increased those divisions that we have? You know, I don't know. I, I, I wish we could be a little bit, I don't think we all have to agree with each other. I just wish we, I don't know why we've become so divided. Um, I don't know why we're, uh, why we're such a divided country. Uh, whatever, blue, red, Republican, Democrat. I, I mean, I have my views. I, I think people should have their views. And I think people should feel comfortable in their views and they should uh, be prepared to defend their views. But I think we have to listen to other people and understand that other people have their views. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I worry that we just, I, I wor I, I, I'm glad we have social media, but I worry sometimes that we, are, we live in an environment where it's too easy to just listen to and engage with people who, who think relatively similarly to how I'm going to say me. I, I live and can kind of listen to people who think pretty closely to the way I think, assuming I can figure out how I think. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. So I, now, the other element is, is leadership. I, when I was, when I was at UNICEF, sometimes I'd be asked, why, why, why aren't more kids going to school? Why aren't more kids immunized and so on? I used to think about, hmm. And you know, it took me a while, and, and this may sound, this is probably gonna sound pretty dopey, but so much of it comes down to leadership. Um, and it, this is not deferring to everybody. We all, we all in our own way have to be leaders, but leadership is a really important thing. And we need, we need quality leadership. Um, it can be diverse diverse views in that leadership. Um, you know, I, I, early on, well, many, many years ago, I was an elected official um, and participated in a legislature and we had different views, but we kind of tried to communicate with each other and, and we seem to not communicate today. So I'm hoping that maybe you all out there in your little boxes, because I only see your names in boxes, but uh, <laughs> this younger generation, maybe it's time to just kind of step back and think whether we can start to talk to each other again. And we don't, you know, talk to each other and see whether we can just talk. Can't we just talk to each other again and not yell at each other again? I, I don't know, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted at how divided this country is. And that's so unfortunate. And, and I have no answer to it at all. I just look at if COVID-19 can have deal with that at all, I'm happy to have had the pandemic. I'm not happy to have had it, particularly as a New Yorker, but um, uh, if that can help us come together a little bit more. I don't think it has, it doesn't seem to be, but maybe it might, and that's a good thing. 
I definitely agree. It's difficult to kind of see the sides that form and that continue to form when it is such a wide sweeping and kind of all encompassing pandemic and not really picking any sides. But um, as we like kind of near towards the end, I wanted to ask what are the biggest questions you think we should be focusing on during the COVID-19 pandemic and also just in general in the 21st century when we kind of trend back to some kind of normalcy, what are the things that we should all be focusing on? Um, equity, 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 inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I, I, I that and it, this doesn't mean everybody is the same. We are not the same and we won't all be at the same place. We just have to think, think about and deal with the barriers um, to, to opportunity so that there is at least more opportunity out there to achieve a, a greater degree of equity and inclusion. Not an absolute, it will never be absolute, that's fine, totally shouldn't be absolute, but just what are some of the barriers? Anyway, I, I know it's getting late and good luck in exams. Good luck to all of you. Um, I wish you the best. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Yeah, thank you, Katie and Carol. Are there any other comments or questions from the group that you want to add to the conversation here before we log off? I do. I, I do appreciate like everybody's good um, Zoom etiquette and keeping muted, <laughs> but it's okay to show your faces and and say a few things too if you'd like to as we as we work toward wrapping up. So, Sophie, would you like to say something? Sorry, my okay, sorry. <laughs> notification <laughs> just <laughs> ringing. <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. So, yeah, I think, Carol, maybe one other thing is uh, Jennifer asked um, how yeah. you were spending your time during social distancing and if you have ideas about staying productive and active um, <laughs> while inside. <laughs> Yeah, how you're keeping up to date, how you're keeping engaged. No. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, you know, some of the things I, I well, I, I, I'm at that point in my life where actually I've been work, working from home for a number of years. So this wasn't something new, although I also traveled a lot for the different meetings and different organizations. So um, kind of the working, and my son, that working from home wasn't so different. It was just that I've always traveled maybe 40, 50% of my time. So I'm not doing that. Um, so uh, uh, I've reconnected, frankly, a, uh, in a number of ways. One with my, with my, um, with the group of, uh, my Peace Corps group in Guatemala three from 1960 nice. to 65. So now we have, a, we, we have a little chat on Zoom every um, Friday, um, and uh, early enough in the afternoon that given our age, we don't fall asleep, uh, so that's good. Uh, no, no, it's a good group, and I mean, people are all over. I mean, I always say my first cross-cultural experience was going to Peace Corps training because I'd never met anybody in the United States from places like Indiana, North Carolina, um, West Virginia, California, places mm -hmm. like that, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I, uh, um, I try and get out and walk for an hour every day or 45 minutes to an hour every day because I can't go to the gym anymore. My, my, the gym in my building is closed. So, um, not, not that I was doing great workouts, but uh, I'm doing that. Um, and, um, and I found, I, and I, here, <laughs> and I follow Larry the cat who is the, who is the 10 Downing Street cat. And if you don't follow Larry the cat, you should all follow Larry. Pluto Living is also, a, it's a dog that you can follow that lives in Canada that has encouraging words, so. Okay. Yeah. I heard that actually, you know what? A friend of mine mentioned that. Actually, the, a friend of mine who's the Episcopal Bishop of Maine actually mentioned Pluto the dog. So. The, yes, yes. He's on Instagram, Facebook, all kinds of things, so. Right. Yeah. That's, it. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, Katie, Carol, thank you so much for a great engaging conversation, helping us think a little bit. 
outside the box here. I think, you know, when we all can be together, there are lots of ways that we can put these ideas into action. But I think um, this idea of what are the questions that we want to act on to kind of see the change that um, we're thinking about with all of this social distancing. How is it that we that we work toward that justice idea, right? That it's not just an idea to think about, but in what ways are we each actively, um, individually and collectively going to work toward that change, I think is a good challenge for us to leave on as we go into these final weeks. Um, so thank you to all of you for engaging in this tonight. Um, and again, if you have any questions or ideas that, you know, stick around for a couple minutes and, and we can chat as folks move on with the rest of their evening. So thank you everyone for being here.